the book of Ecclesiastes is part of what is called Jewish wisdom literature. The wisdom literature includes books like Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Job, and Ecclesiastes. And the point of wisdom literature is very, very practical. It has to do with day-to-day life, how to manage life properly. That's the whole point of wisdom literature. It is to help people live well. Now, many people read these books like, like Proverbs, like Ecclesiastes, and say, you know, it seems to boil down to common sense. It's just kind of common sense issues, and that is correct. The wisdom literature is largely common sense from God's perspective and God's advice to us, because living well depends on common sense. The American humorist and philosopher Will Rogers once said, common sense isn't as common as it used to be. Well, I'm not sure it ever was, really. The problem with common sense is that we know it, we just don't do it. We think we have it, we fail to practice it in our everyday lives. We often make choices that make no sense. Common sense is actually pretty uncommon when you think about it. So, we need the exhortations of Ecclesiastes to exercise common sense in our everyday lives. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, where we pick up in our study this morning, we have a series of common sense principles to help us live well in our everyday experiences. First of all, we are exhorted to be smart. The people in power are not always right. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning in verse, uh, chapter 10, beginning in verse 2, excuse me. A wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. Even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. If the ruler's temper, anger, rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, like an error which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places, while rich men sit in humble places. I have seen slaves riding on horses, and princes walking like slaves on the land. For those of you who are fans of the comic strip Dilbert, you know that Dilbert celebrates the survival of the average working man. Scott Adams in the Dilbert Principle calls them Dilbert's laws of work. Don't be irreplaceable. If you can't be replaced, you can't be promoted. When you don't know what to do, walk fast and look worried. Everything can be filed under miscellaneous. If you are good, you will be assigned all the work. If you are really good, you will get out of it. If it wasn't for the last moment, nothing would get done. Keep your boss's boss off your boss's back. Eat one live toad the first thing in the morning, and nothing worse will happen to you the rest of the day. (laughs) I like Dilbert. (laughs) Well... His advice is not always too practical. (laughs) It's a little sarcastic, certainly. But the bottom line is that we need to have street smarts, if you will, if we are to live well in this world. And street smarts would be another way of defining biblical wisdom literature. It is the writings about street smarts. God tells us that a wise man's heart leads him to the right, and a fool's heart leads him to the left. Now, at the risk of offending all of you left-handed people this morning, (laughs) obviously the metaphor was that right is right and left is wrong in this metaphor. And a wise man knows how 
to do what is right. He knows how to keep himself out of danger. He knows how to make good choices in life. And a foolish man, well, he makes stupid choices. He leans to the left and he exposes his life to problems. And Solomon goes on to say in verse 3, that even when a fool is just walking down the street, eventually he proves to everyone that he is a fool. By what he says, what he does, you say, that guy's nuts. He's a fool. Solomon goes on in verse 4 to give one practical example of some street smarts, if you will. If a ruler is angry with you, it is best not to abandon your position, he says. In other words, when the boss gets mad at you, translated into our world, don't quit, don't resign your position in a fit of frustration. And you've probably noticed people who just can't take the anger of the boss, uh, the king in this case. And they, they just, in a, in a fit of frustration, that's it, I'm done, and they quit. They resign their position, they abandon their position. Well, the decision, Solomon said, is a dumb decision because now you don't have a job. And to use uh, another proverb that we often say today, you cut off your nose to spite your face. Instead, Solomon says, be smart. Have street smarts in the working world. Solomon tells us that in the next clause, composure alleviates great offenses. The NIV says, calmness can lay great errors to rest. Be calm. Your boss may be a jerk. He may be, or she may be, for that matter. But quitting will not help you and will not solve the problem just because your boss is a jerk. If you respond calmly, if you respond with composure in that situation, you can mitigate the boss's errors and solve the problem for the company in a way that is good for you and for those that work with you. And that is street smarts in the corporate world. Solomon goes on to talk about a great evil. I have seen a great evil, he says, under the sun. Now, remember that Solomon uses this term evil in the book of Ecclesiastes not so much to refer to some immoral act or moral evil in that sense. He uses it to simply mean something that is unjust, unfair, catastrophic, a, a major problem, a calamity. In this case, he says, I have seen an evil in this world, a calamity, an unjust situation, a ruler, or again, in our world, a boss, plays favorites. The ruler or the boss reverses the order of fair promotion and elevates fools and slaves to positions of power and honor, while those who deserve the positions end up being promoted and those who could do those positions the best end up being demoted, excuse me. Now, we see that kind of unfairness play out in the world, certainly. People don't always get ahead on merit. The promotions don't always come to those who do the best job. Sometimes company politics get in the way. Sometimes other issues get in the way. And sometimes fools are promoted into those jobs that a wise person would do much be better. <coughs> it's not fair, Solomon says. But it is life under the sun. It's life here on this earth. There's unjust, unfair things that happen in the workplace, in the community. Be smart, he says. The people in power are not always right. And the decisions that executives make don't always make the company better. As believers, then, our faith is where? It's not in presidents or governors or executives, it is in the Lord. And we trust Him. And we need to respond to unfair, 
and angry bosses and situations and fools who do stupid things in our world with calmness and composure because life has a way of turning around in the end because God is in control. Every day for close to seven years, Walter Buck Swords cursed and stomped his feet in his favorite restaurant, Luby's Cafeteria, demanding that he get his food exactly the way he wanted, wanted it or it went back and he was just a terrible customer in that little cafeteria. And every day for seven years, he demanded his favorite waitress, Melinda Salazar, to be to wait on him, to serve him. Every day for close to seven years, she did whatever she could to help this very demanding, nasty customer. And when Walter Swords died at 89 years of age, just days before Christmas in 2007, he left Salazar $50,000 and a 2,000 Buick in his will for waiting on him. I still can't believe it, she said. After all, she says, he was always kind of mean. You ever met people like that? She had street smarts. She knew how to maintain her composure, to be calm in the face of people who are just plain mean. Second principle, be prepared, do the work when it needs to be done. Verses 8 through 11. He who digs a pit may fall into it, and a servant, a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there is no profit for the charmer. Now, the key to understanding Solomon's point in this little batch of verses is found in a word he uses in verse 10, and he repeats again in verse 11. The Hebrew word means advantage or profit, gain. The point is that wisdom, he says, brings advantages or profit. Wisdom helps us be successful, verse 10. But the profit or the gain that wisdom can bring to us in life can be nullified if we do not pay attention to the small things in life. Wisdom must be applied in everyday, sometimes minor experiences of life if we're going to be successful. See, wisdom isn't about figuring out the big decisions. Wisdom is about all the little things that happen in life, in everyday life, and doing well. But wisdom has to be applied. Wisdom can bring us profit, can bring us advantages, but it must be applied in order to bring us those advantages. We must be prepared to do what needs to be done, and we must do it when it needs to be done, or we will lose the profit that wisdom can bring into our lives. And Solomon sets out four little proverbs that warn us about the dangers we can experience in the small tasks of life. Wisdom helps us avert these dangers because we're prepared for what might happen. He who digs a pit may fall into it, proverb number one. He who digs through a wall may get bit by a snake. He who quarries stones may be injured by stones. He who splits logs may be endangered by them. Sounds like common sense, doesn't it? I mean, you dig a hole in your backyard and you go out at 11 o'clock at night and it's dark, you just might fall into the hole if you've forgotten that you dug a hole there. Common sense. You dig through a wall. Well, there might be a snake there. We don't have the problem so much up here in the state in, in Maine because we don't have poisonous snakes. But somewhere else, there might be a poisonous snake there. You might get bit. He who quarries stones. I mean, a stone might fall on you. He who splits logs. Well, the axe might cut you or a log might fall on you. These things happen. Watch out, be prepared in the little things in life because these are not big things. These are little things that you're doing that could endanger you. 
And he goes on to exhort us in these verses to be prepared for everything in life. Because when you're least prepared, one of these little things can happen that really cause damage and harm to you. If you're going to split wood, a sharp axe will make the job a lot easier, which reminds me this morning that I need to sharpen my axe. Right? Wisdom helps us succeed because wisdom teaches us to be prepared for what might happen on the job or in our homes. Wisdom also must be applied in a timely manner. If we procrastinate, anybody here procrastinate? Hmm. If we procrastinate, we may find out that it's too late to apply the wisdom, and so we forfeit the benefits or profit that wisdom could bring to our lives. How often do we procrastinate on a matter only to act too late to solve the problem? Procrastination is one of those little things in life that has big consequences. What we do needs to be done when it needs to be done to be successful. It is the wisdom of small things. And that's why Solomon says, look, if a snake bites a person before the snake is charmed, there's no profit, no gain to the charmer. The person is dead. You can't go back and say, oops, there are no do-overs when it comes to snake charming. Now, this, by the way, was a common activity in the ancient world where people would go around these snake charmers and they'd have their snakes and they'd charm them for a fee and make a profit on that. In fact, it's still done today. I grew up in the country of Pakistan, for example. And I can remember as a child, a snake charmer coming to our house and somebody had paid him to come and do his snake charming thing. And he had his basket there in front of him and he started playing and he took the lid off the basket and he started playing in this big cobra comes up out of the basket, swaying in in time with the music. Man, I lit out of there so fast. Whoa, that thing was scary. And we had an an outside balcony, basically, and I I ran up to the outside balcony. I figured, I'm a lot safer up there looking down at that thing. Well, Solomon says, look, what profit is there if the snake comes out of that basket and bites somebody, and kills the person before the snake charmer actually charms the snake. I mean, nobody's going to be happy. The person's dead, and the charmer's not going to get his money, and it doesn't work. You have to do things on time. You'd better be charming that snake before something bad happens. You can't wait. You can't procrastinate. And that's the way it is with us in all of life, really. All our good intentions are nullified if we do not do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. If we do it too late, then the consequences are already in place. Delay is the deadliest form of denial, Northcote Parkinson said. Delay is the deadliest form of denial. He was, asked to, he was asked to explain it once at a tea. I will, replied Parkinson, in a few minutes. <laughs> in other words, I won't. Over lunch, author Craig Larson visited with a fellow employer, employee excuse me, named Cindy, and he learned that her father taught music at Wheaton College and also coordinated the artist series there at the, at the college. And the, those positions allowed him to, to meet celebrated musicians who were to perform at Wheaton College. And one year, George Zell, a legendary music director from the Cleveland Orchestra, was one of those celebrities. And he showed up, and Cindy met him while she was in her early teen years. Cindy's father introduced her to Zell and pointed out that she played the viola. The first thing he did was he put his fingers under her chin and he lifted to see the left side of her jaw. And then he said, it doesn't look like she practices very much. Why? Because violin, viola players holding that instrument under their chin, if they practice a lot, they get a 
the darkness that forms here on the skin from all of their practice. She doesn't practice very much, I can tell. You see, we aren't going to be very successful in life. We aren't going to live well, Solomon says, if we fail to practice diligently the little things that we're called to do. Be prepared. Do the work when it needs to be done. Don't procrastinate. All right, the third common sense exhortation that will help us be successful in life is be careful. Big mouths won't lead us home. Verse 12. Words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, while the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. Yet the fool multiplies words. No man knows what will happen and who can tell him what will come after him. The the toil, the work of a fool, so wearies him that he does not even know how to to go to the city. So a wise man is someone who speaks gracious words. The Hebrew can be translated favorable words or words that elicit a favorable response from others. In other words, a wise man knows how to talk to people in such a way that others respond in a positive way. When we use words graciously with other people, we win the favor of those to whom we speak. When we're harsh and nasty, we cause more problems. As the saying goes, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Another proverb. Don't you like all the proverbs? Well, that's wisdom literature, street smarts. A fool, he says, however, is always saying and talking in destructive ways. He's consumed by the words that just kind of flow out of his mouth. His words are self-destructive in that they... The backlash comes back upon him and destroys him. A foolish person never seems to learn that his mean and nasty words are destructive. Instead, the fool just opens his mouth and out gushes lots more words. The next thing he says is even more outrageous than the last thing he said because he's a what? Fool. There's no political correctness, by the way, in Ecclesiastes, because he's a fool. All of that foolish talk, the beginning of it is crazy enough, but the end is wicked madness. It's craziness. So Solomon warns us to control our tongues because a healthy society depends on healthy words. A healthy church depends on healthy words. A healthy family depends on healthy words. Gracious words are wise. Nasty words are foolish. And few words are wise. And many words are foolish. I like what President Calvin Coolidge once said, I have noticed that nothing I never said ever did me any harm. That's good advice. Controlling the tongue. Wow. This is really practical, isn't it? Controlling the tongue is one of the marks of a wise man or woman. Do you have self-control over what you say and how you say it? Because one character trait of a fool is that he or she multiplies words. They just gush from his mouth in torrents. He loves to hear himself talk, and he has a high opinion of what he has to say. Verse 14 tells us that the fool is the one who loudly proclaims to everyone that he knows the way, he knows the future, he knows what's coming. Nobody can tell a fool anything. He says, who can tell a fool what is to happen? He thinks he knows it all already. And he talks like a know-it-all too. Verse 15 says that the work of a fool so wearies him that he doesn't even know his way back to the city. It's a proverbial expression again that points to the fact that the fool is constantly embroiled in one controversy 
after another. And these constant arguments that erupt from what he says wear him out. He doesn't even know how to get back home. He gets so tired of the work of arguing with people, he can't find his way home. We have a modern proverb that expresses that kind of sentiment when we say that a person doesn't even know enough to come out of the rain. Solomon warns us, look, don't follow these kinds of people, these kinds of loud mouth fools, because they will never lead us home. We will never find contentment. We won't find security following a fool in life. Fools boldly lead us right into destruction. During a 1923 training exercise, a naval destroyer called the USS Delphi led a flotilla of seven destroyers, seven vessels, down the California coast. The USS Delphi was captained by a lieutenant commander, Donald T. Hunter. He was a very experienced navigator and an instructor at the Naval Academy. But without warning, as they traveled down the California coast, they encountered a thick blanket of fog. Hunter would later describe it as being like pea soup. He couldn't get an accurate calculation of his location. And contrary to where he thought he was, the lead ship was headed right into Devil's Jaw which was a very rocky set of outcroppings along the California coast. But that didn't stop Lieutenant Commander Hunter from just forging right ahead, full steam. Wasn't surprising to those who knew them, knew him, for Hunter was known for his self-confident, I know the way, I can get it done, decisiveness and what others called his magic infallibility when it came to guiding his ships. Well, traveling at 20 knots, the USS Delphi smashed broadside into the rocky shoreline. The force of the collision ripped the ship in two. One by one, the other ships roared full tilt right into that same rocky coast, and all seven ships were destroyed. And 20 seamen lost their lives. It still stands as one of the worst peacetime naval disasters in American history. All because a fool was leading the way. And in his bravado and his confidence, He led everyone right into destruction. Be careful. Big mouths won't lead us home. Fourth principle, be alert. Lazy leaders bring down a nation. Verse 16. Woe to you, O land, O country, whose king is a child, a lad, and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through indolence, the rafters sag and through slackness, the house leaks. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment and wine makes life merry and money is the answer to everything. Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king and in your sleeping rooms, do not curse a rich man for a bird of the heavens will carry the sound and the winged creature will make the matter known. The joke is told about a CEO who had taken on a new job. The outgoing CEO says to him when he took on this job, look, sometimes you're going to make some wrong choices. Everybody does. You'll mess up. And when that happens, I have prepared Three envelopes for you in the desk drawer. The first time that you mess up, something bad happens, open envelope number one. The second time you mess up, open envelope number two. And the third time you mess up, open envelope number three. For the first few months, everything goes fine in the company. And then the CEO makes a mistake and something bad happens. And so he goes to the top drawer, he pulls out envelope number one, and the message reads, blame me. So he does. He says, this is the old CEO's fault. He made this mess. 
I inherited all these problems, and now we have to work to straighten them out. And everybody says, okay, makes sense. We give you that. Things go along pretty well for a while. Then he makes his second mistake. So he goes to the drawer, and he takes out envelope number two. And envelope number two says, blame the board. So he does. It's the board's fault. The board has made a mess. I inherited all of that. They're the problem. We've got to fix it. And everybody says, okay, that makes sense. Things go fine for a while, and then he makes his third mistake. So he goes to the drawer, and he opens up envelope number three. And the message says, prepare three envelopes. (laughs) Prepare three envelopes. We see that a lot in life, actually, (laughs) the blame game. Solomon says, look, leadership can bring a nation down, can bring a company down. And he says, look, woe, woe to the country that has a king who acts like a child. The word can be translated servant or slave, but basically means someone who lacks the maturity to make good decisions, plays around, is lazy, blames other people. This king is a is childlike, just wants to party with his princes. They feast in the morning. Now, a morning feast, of course, is the height of laziness and foolishness. But happy, he says, the land, the country, that has a leader who works hard, feasts, yes, at the proper time for strength, not for drunkenness. The leader who is lazy, he says, is like a homeowner who has a sagging roof, and he doesn't fix the roof because he's lazy and he's doing other things, and eventually the roof collapses. collapses. That leaky, leaky roof collapses all around the homeowner. Well. A leader, a lazy leader is like that in a country, in a company. Verse 19 expresses the attitude, I think, of the lazy leader. The lazy leader, he likes bread and wine and throws money at everything, Solomon says. Now remember, Solomon's been a king for many years here. This lazy leader has the philosophy that you got a problem, you throw more money at it to solve the problem, and you hope that the problem goes away. Solomon says, that's a lazy leader. To him, money solves, more money solves all problems. And Solomon says, lazy leaders like this, they're going to bring a nation down. They will bring a company down. They will destroy it. So, what do we do with lazy leaders? Well, how should we respond? Solomon says, all right, be careful. Be smart. Verse 20 tells us to be alert and don't curse the king or the rich boss who's doing stupid things. Be careful what you say, even if the leader is a fool, because some little birdie will carry what you said back to the leader and you'll have to reap the consequences. Now, Solomon is not telling us here that we should never speak up or face up to what is wrong, but rather that when we speak, we better realize that we will have to stand and face the results of what we say. Don't hide behind gossip. Don't whisper your complaints here and there as if you're safe in the whispering. Because sooner or later, word will get back to the person you're whispering about. And in this day and age, my goodness, that is so true, isn't it? With telecommunications the way they are, there's always a cell phone around, a camera. There's all the social networking. And people are constantly getting in trouble with their Twittering or tweeting or whatever that is that they do. Because I haven't gotten that far in my technological pursuits. But it's out there. It's constantly out there. And he says, watch out. Be careful what you're saying. Even if the person is a fool, you'll get in trouble. And 
you need to be able to willing to stand up and face what it is you're saying. So don't curse your boss in the bedroom and compliment him in the boardroom. Don't be two-faced. Be alert to the fact that lazy leaders will bring down a company or a nation. Good leadership is essential. But what makes a good leader? That question was asked by the Army War College in their study of the most prestigious generals in the Iraq War, the most highly regarded generals. They did a study of them. Subordinates rated the officers anonymously. The responses in order of importance are up here. The wisest generals, best leaders, keep cool under pressure. Clearly explains mission standards and priorities. Sees the big picture, provides context and perspective, makes tough, sound decisions on time. One of the study's authors, General Walter Ulmer, who's a retired general, said, One thing we found in our study of the generals in the Iraq war is that it's still easier to teach teach technical skills than to teach people how to gain trust and build teams. Ulmer noted that many key behaviors are learned by example. So good leaders tend to produce good leaders and bad leaders produce bad leaders. Living well. Depends on common sense. Do you have common sense on the job, in the community? We need to practice it, don't we? Jay Kessler, president of Taylor University, told about a state trooper who was given the outstanding trooper award by the governor. And as an outstanding trooper, he was characterized as being the best of the best that year. And Jay Kessler, who happened to attend the same church as this state trooper, said to him one day, look, the the, the governor said that in 15 years you would handle every very uh, difficult situation very, very well without getting upset. You were able to handle everything perfectly. The drunks that would abuse you and other things, you didn't retaliate and you handled everything so well. And that's why you were given this outstanding trooper award. And Jay Kessler said, well, How can you do that? It's a tough, hard job. You're facing people who say and do things that are that that test the self-control of anyone. How could you do so well for so long? The trooper responded, well, I guess two things. First, if I am called to break up a fight at a bar, I never say to myself, there's a drunk. I always say to myself, there's a man, someone's husband, someone's son, someone's neighbor who got drunk. So I always try to think of him as a man, not a crime. Secondly, the Bible says that a soft answer turns away wrath. So whenever I walk up to the window of an automobile, I always speak a little lower than the person I'm speaking to. Sounds like pretty biblical common sense to me. And it would be good for all of us to practice it in our lives, right? Father, help us to live common sense lives, to follow principles that will lead to living well because that honors you. Give us your mind, your spirit in all of our relationships, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.